Good morning, saints. Here we are once again, ready for another word from God's word. I hope that you have your Bible in hand, can follow along. We've been preaching our way through 1 Peter, and we've been seeing not just the possibility, but the probability of suffering in the life of a believer. Uh, fiery trials are something to be expected. Uh, we're not to be alarmed by them. We don't necessarily cherish them. We don't like it when they come, but they're to be expected in the life of a believer. We see in 1 Peter 1 and 6, he says, you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness. Some of you are going through times when you really feel heavy of heart because of what you're facing. You're in heaviness through manifold temptations. And most of you remember that word temptations does not necessarily mean the temptation to sin, but it's that whole gamut of things, trials, tests, tribulations that we face as believers. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold. God has a plan. He has a purpose. Uh, things don't just happen to us for no purpose. More precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then Peter said that we're to have our conversation, our lifestyle, he says, honest before the Gentiles. Verse 12 of 1 Peter 2, having your conversation, your lifestyle, honest, pure, holy, uh, reputable among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. So our lives are to be above reproach uh, so that we can silence those, as we've seen before in these messages, those who would come against us. 1 Peter 2.15, For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. The ignorance of foolish men. Now, there's a blessing in suffering for what's right. Certainly no blessing in suffering for what's wrong. Uh, chapter 2, verse 19, for this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Make sure if you suffer, it's for the right reason and not for doing wrong. For what glory is it when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently. But if when you do well and suffer for it, you do suffer patiently or you take it patiently, that's acceptable with God. Now, our example in suffering for doing what is right is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Look at chapter 2, verse 21. For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. Uh, we follow in his steps in allowing, uh, allowing ourselves to face suffering with uh, God's will at heart, facing suffering hopefully hope, uh, facing that suffering diligently, not giving up in the face of suffering. That brings us right to where we were last week. We read these words, verse 16 of chapter 3. Having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that accuse you falsely, your good conversation in Christ, for it is better if the will of God be so, that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. So it's in light of that that we read our preaching text for today, and I know that's been a lot of scriptures. Hopefully you've jotted those down and you'll get a chance to look at them in a little more detail uh, later on. But 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22, we want to talk about the suffering of Jesus Christ and our suffering too. Verse 18, for Christ also hath once suffered for sins. Uh, we're not going to talk about that word once too much, but I will tell you that he never had to do it again. The sacrifice of Christ does not have to be repeated. It was once for all. If you have a concordance, get a concordance out and look for that word once or one time there in Hebrews. Christ's sacrifice was once for all. He hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Strange statement, is it? Preaching to the spirits in prison, which some time were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing. 
wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water, the like figure, whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. So we're following his lead, his example in enduring afflictions and suffering for what is good, but our suffering obviously is not the same as his. We're going to look at how Jesus' suffering is different than the suffering that we face. First of all, Jesus Christ suffered for the sins of others. Uh, we will suffer, and it can be a part of our sanctification process, some of the things that God allows us to go through. It can be a valuable thing. He compares it to gold here in 1 Peter, but it cannot atone ever in any way, shape, or form for our own sin or the sin of someone else. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church, for example, has what they call a uh, the concept of the treasury of merit. Uh, it's just kind of like a treasure chest, and, and you know, the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ are placed in that chest, but also the merits of the saints. You know, they have perhaps done good things that are above and beyond what they needed, and they're placed in that chest where we can all benefit from it. Their sufferings perhaps are, are placed there. But we know very clearly from the Word of God that only the sacrifice of Christ can atone for sin. Uh, my suffering does not atone for my own sin, nor can it atone for the, the sin of anyone else. Jesus' suffering, however, was a suffering that did atone. Jesus' suffering atoned for my sin and for your sin. Jesus' suffering on the cross, his death on the cross, provided the sacrifice that is needed to atone for the sins of all of mankind. As Peter puts it here, he suffered for our sin in our place. He did not deserve to suffer, of course, on his own, but he did it because of our need. He gave himself so that we might have life. That's what we read in Galatians 1. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins. The Bible says God so loved the world, and here it tells us Jesus gave himself. So his suffering was much different. We recognize that it was faced willingly. Uh, he tells us that no man could take his life from him, but he gave it willingly. So you may suffer unjustly, uh, you may suffer wrongly, but your suffering, unlike Jesus' suffering, can never atone for sin. Secondly, Jesus suffered alone. You and I are promised the abiding presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who promised, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. Charles Spurgeon once related a story that he'd read in Fox's Book of Martyrs. If you're not familiar with that little book, you can often pick them up very cheap, cheaply, but it is a book that records the victorious death of some of God's martyrs in days gone by. But he speaks of one of them that was burned at the stake. It was a horrifying tale. As it describes how his legs burned away as well as the stake, and ultimately as the stake burned away, his uh, legless body at that time fell into the flames. Uh, you could not even distinguish his features. But one was there close to where this was going on and heard his final words. Two words came out of his mouth, and uh, Spurgeon's words are very telling. He says, that poor wretched carcass or that poor burned carcass opened its mouth and two words came out. What were they? Sweet Jesus. And then he was gone and in the presence of God. Horrible and beautiful all at the same time. But it, it lets us know that even in that horrible state, that, that suffering that we cannot even imagine, that that martyr would have endured, that he still felt the presence of sweet, precious Jesus there at the hour of his death. How glorious and how wonderful. We think of Psalm 23 that says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. So all through the word of God, we're promised the enduring presence of God no matter what we're facing. However, Jesus, when he suffered on the cross for our sins, the Bible says uh, that he felt very alone. How do we know that? Well, he cried out in Aramaic, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which interpreted in English means, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And, and that must have been the most excruciating suffering that he endured on the cross as the father had to turn his 
gaze away from the Son of God as he bore your sins and my sins. Uh, I believe he felt a loneliness that we cannot even comprehend, and he faced that for you and me. He faced something that I believe was very much akin to the suffering of hell itself. A uh, hell is eternal separation from the presence of God, and I don't anticipate going to hell because Jesus suffered and died for me, and I, I've received that. I've, I've trusted in that. I've placed my full faith in that. You know, I'm not going to the lake of fire. I'm not going to ever know a day when I'm separated from God because Jesus Christ suffered alone there on the cross doing it for me that I might never know, even for a moment, what it is to suffer alone. Thank God I'll never see hell. I don't say that flippantly. I don't say that boastfully. I say that because of the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Praise God forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for suffering alone that I need never suffer alone. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for suffering what was very much akin to the fires of hell that I need never face the fires of hell myself. Praise the Lord forever. Number three, Christ suffered as a just man. For unjust people. Peter says his suffering was the just for the unjust. He was the only person that truly, truly did not deserve what came to him. He's the only pure and holy and righteous and just person who's ever lived. Now we may suffer as we've seen here for doing what's right, but in reality, we're still very, very flawed individuals. But yet Jesus was tempted in all points, church, like as we are, the Bible says, yet without sin. He suffered as a perfect, holy, just man. You know, he is represented in the Old Testament by all of those spotless sacrifices. You know, a lamb had to be without spot or blemish because Jesus is the spotless, holy, pure, and just lamb of God that takes away the sins of the whole world. And he died as a perfect, just man for unjust people. If you ever get the idea that he doesn't want you in heaven, think again. Because what he suffered for you, what he did for you on the cross, should eliminate forever and ever and ever any thought that he does not want you in heaven. He's not willing that any should perish. If, if you go to hell, it's not because he wanted you to go to hell. It's because you chose that route. A perfect holy man dying for vile sinners like you and me. Fourth, Jesus Christ suffered, but glory followed that suffering. It says Jesus was put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Put to death in the flesh, that means he literally died. And there are some cults out there, various ones that say Jesus didn't truly die. He just swooned perhaps on the cross. But let me tell you, he really and truly died. There is no way a human being could endure what he endured. Uh, the Bible makes it very clear that he died, but also that he rose again. That's what that word quickened means. It means to be brought back to life. He rose from that grave by the power of the Holy Spirit. Death could not hold him. Uh, the grave could not keep him from rising again. And that brings us to a promise. There's a promise that you and I have based on that wonderful event Romans 8, 11, it says, But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken or bring to life your mortal bodies by the Spirit that dwelleth in you. So because Jesus rose triumphantly from the dead, you and I know that even when we face that final obstacle, that final enemy of death, ultimately these bodies are going to rise again by the power of the Holy Spirit. We will experience a resurrection. I will remember a funeral many years ago in this very sanctuary where I'm speaking to you today, a dear saint of God. And at her funeral, as her body was being wheeled down this aisle that is right before me today, a grandson played on the guitar and sang a song that said, ain't no grave going to hold this body down. Very beautiful, very powerful because it was so true. Jesus says, because I live you shall live also. We've got that promise. Oh yes, Jesus suffered, but that suffering and that death was followed by resurrection. Now, this next part of Peter's words here can be somewhat puzzling. What did Jesus do on the cross between his death and his resurrection? 
Puzzling indeed. Now, there are some differences of opinion, and I may, sh may share some of those with you, but ultimately we see that Christ proclaimed his victory during that time. Look at verse 19, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Now, who are these imprisoned spirits? Which sometimes were disobedient, so we know these aren't godly spirits. Well, when did they live? Well, he says, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. So these are from the days of Noah. While the ark was a preparing. So, you know, some might say, well, these are the spirits of those who died in the flood. No, this is before the flood. Wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Well, he's preaching to someone during that time. The, the word preach here is caruso, means to proclaim like, like a herald. He's proclaiming the victory of the cross. Who are these spirits in prison? Well, most believe that these are the spirits of those angels that uh, the Bible speaks about in the Old Testament that left their first estate. Those angels we read about in Genesis chapter 6, and even though there again, that's a mysterious chapter, we know that